exploitive behavior. Absolutely. These folks engage in exploitive behavior and they love to take advantage of others to their own end. They see people as tools that they can utilize in order to get their own feelings, to get their own agendas achieved. Imagine a world where every compliment you give is twisted into a spotlight for someone else's grand stage. Welcome to the mind of a narcissist where superiority isn't just a trait, it becomes a way of life. And by the end of this video, you're gonna recognize those traits so that you can decide for yourself if you want to continue in this type of relationship, whether it's a friendship or romantic or not. And are these traits consciously or unconsciously attractive to you? And are you drawing these people into your interpersonal romantic friendship circle? Well, you gotta know these seven traits, these seven narcissistic superiority traits to figure it out. So let's get into it. Now, narcissistic superiority is a trait that's often associated with those with NPD, which is narcissistic personality disorder, or those along the narcissistic personality disorder spectrum. And that means that these are folks that have a lot or a preponderance of narcissistic traits and influences their behaviors and attitudes, how they see themselves, how they see others, and how they see and interact with their world. And that's where it usually includes you. Now, there are some common traits and behaviors that are related to narcissistic superiority. First and foremost, this is one of those central components of narcissism, and this is grandiosity and entitlement. And these individuals and these traits often are exhibited as this intensive sense of self-importance. And they believe that they are superior to others. At least they exhibit that behavior or they communicate that perspective as though they are. And due to this, this grandiosity, these expectations tend to feed this idea that they deserve special treatment and feel entitled to that special treatment without really having to do anything to earn it or haven't done anything in the past to earn it. And that's that grandiosity and entitlement. It's this fake balloon that they kind of blow up for themselves. And the people that are in their life tend to sort of fall into it. And initially it can seem like really attractive. Like, wow, this person is really confident and you're really into them and things like that. But over time, you start to begin to see a little deeper. As intimacy starts to build, you start to see inside them a little more, see some of those fears, see some of those concerns. You start to get a sense or scent, you're able to kind of smell it a little bit, of their fear, shame, doubt, inferiority, guilt. And these are sort of those five core content areas that are kind of classic for individuals with narcissistic personality disorder. And the way that they compensate for those five classic core content areas is grandiosity and entitlement. And it creates this sense of impaired insight and it feeds this sense of superiority that they have this sense of that I am over you, that I deserve more than you. And sometimes they identify people or people allow themselves to get into those relationships where they kind of buy into it initially. But over time, depending on the sophistication of the individual who exhibits grandiosity, entitlement, various narcissistic traits, or the full personality disorder, you kind of fall into it, right? You, you don't see it until you're way down the road. Well, the next one, and this is this sense of arrogance and being domineering. And it is this superior attitude that comes across as very arrogant or haughty. Well, yeah, of course. Like whenever you say something, they're like, of course. And you're like, what, wait, oh, wait, am I wrong? Because you said that? And it's the tone, right? They have that tone, that haughty tone. So even if you're saying something and they're agreeing with it, but they agree with it and they provide a sense of, wait, why do I feel smaller? Because you just agreed with me. It's the tone. It's, well, of course it's like that. And it's, oh, okay. Well, you know, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Of course, everyone knows that. They, they do? Oh, okay. Okay, oh, and you're like, huh? And it, it can put you off balance a little bit. And that's what a lot of narcissists like to do because it gives them that sense of superiority. And I see this a lot when I first start with individuals in therapy doing treatment on narcissistic traits and personality disorder. So 
we start to see that they work, whether consciously or unconsciously, to create this disparity. And this is healthy treatment. This is that therapy where you're working with your therapist and you guys are working together and you're figuring stuff out. But when there's a disparity, you're missing each other. And it becomes a big waste of therapeutic time. And that haughty and arrogance is really something that we have to get around in therapy. Maybe you've had relationships like this too, where you know, you're having this conversation and then suddenly you're like, wait, what? Wait, this isn't, we're out of alignment. That's because the narcissistic individual and their internal fragility that it creates this this power disparity. You kind of, you feel it. You feel it inside, right? And you may rationalize it away, but you feel it. Usually your gut is like, mm, something doesn't feel right. And then when we talk about domineering is that these individuals like to dominate those conversations and they impose their view on others. And the reason why they like to dominate the conversation is so that they can feel empowered. Remember, they have this sense of internalized fragility related to those five core content areas that we just talked about that I mentioned. And being able to dominate the conversation means that I can control it and steer it in a way that protects my internal fears, my core content areas. So you see this arrogance and domineering behaviors and tactics get exhibited. And that's part of those traits that we see in order to maintain that narcissistic superiority. Now the next trait we see is it's belittling or criticizing of others. And this is something we see a lot in narcissistic individuals. This goes right to that narcissistic fragility. We know it's there. This is that they frequently put others down and they hold this really irrational view. And you see this a lot with, with parents, with narcissistic parents, in that a lot of times they will demean the child in order for them to have this sense of superiority. So I make you feel small enough so I feel powerful enough. Now think about that. That doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you think about like self-esteem and confidence because self-esteem and confidence, genuine self-esteem and confidence, is based on your ability to achieve things that are challenging in your life and get over it. And people that are in our life that should be, and we gotta be careful with those shoulds, right? That should be helping us achieve those things. And when we have narcissism, superior, superiority, narcissistic superiority, what happens is, is that they put others down so they feel better. It becomes very, very self-serving. And it helps to really give them a sense of foundation as much as they can have that I am superior because I can point to you what's wrong with you. And sometimes it's really unclear because a lot of times they'll use backhanded compliments or comments and then it's sort of like, wait, what? For example, oh, you look good in that dress. I never thought it, it would fit you. What? <laughs> because really what they're saying when we translate that, it's that, oh, well, I never thought you'd lose enough weight or that you would become physically fit or you would reach this physical goal, whatever it is, to fit into that dress. Huh? So it sounds like a compliment on the front but on the back, we know that it's really a put down. And we see this and then criticizing others, which goes right to those backhanded you know, compliments, that criticizing of others and the belittling, it, it's hand in hand. And they criticize others again to feel important or to illustrate a talent. Oh, well, they, they can't do that, really? Oh man, wow, that's just a shocker. And sometimes it's stuff that's really hard, right? It could be like playing an instrument. It could be playing a sport whatever it is, but they are quick to criticize others. And their purpose of criticizing others is to show I can illustrate other people's failures because I am superior and I know more than you do. Now, the next one, this is a lack of empathy. And this is really interesting for those along the narcissistic spectrum. Now, when we talk about narcissistic superiority, that lack of empathy is absolutely a part of it because if you have empathy for someone and you belittle them or you act in an arrogant, haughty, domineering way, you're going to feel bad about it. But the more empathy you lack, and this is on a spectrum, it's not like you don't have, you have zero empathy or 100 empathy. It doesn't work that way because it's on a spectrum, right? It goes from zero to 100, let's say, and everybody's kind of in between there and it changes every day and fluctuates. But so when we talk about lack of empathy and narcissism, the higher the narcissism, usually the lower the empathy. And they kind of need it so that they can maintain that sense of narcissistic superiority. So that 
when I do belittle you and all those things, right, arrogant, haughty, domineering, that I don't feel bad about it. So what happens is that I keep my fragile narcissistic self intact. I keep my narcissistic superiority intact. And they can come across very cold, dismissing, as though they don't care. Here's the interesting thing, and if you've seen my other narcissistic videos, you know that I've talked about this, because the research is very, very fascinating when we talk about lack of empathy and individuals along the narcissistic spectrum. And this is, it's not that they don't have empathy. It's not that they can't access it. They just choose not to. It's very different than someone who is along the antisocial spectrum where that we see, depending on the severity along the antisocial spectrum, that the greater the impairment, the greater the lack of empathy, and the harder it is, or it is an inability, to tap into empathy. Whereas your narcissistic person, they just choose not to. Why? Because you're not really worth, you, me, anybody else, you're not really worth the energy to do that. And if I feel bad about my behaviors that encourage my narcissism, then I'm not going to do it. So then I have to come to terms with perhaps my fear, shame, doubt, guilt, and inferiority. So it's very protective. That lack of empathy is very, very protective. Exploitive behavior. Absolutely. These folks engage in exploitive behavior and they love to take advantage of others to their own end. They see people as tools that they can utilize in order to get their own feelings, to get their own agendas achieved. And again, th th we can attach it to that lack of empathy too, because if you exploit somebody, presumably, you would feel bad about it. But these folks typically don't. Now again, remember, just we talked about that empathy is, it's a spectrum. So you may get little you know, smatterings of empathy, and that's great. That's a very helpful thing. In therapy, we, I start to look for some empathy indicators that they're questioning their behavior, questioning their motives. These exploited behaviors, so the more advantage that I take of you, the more adverse and painful situations that I can put you in, the more power I feel. That feeds that narcissistic ego. That's that, mm -mm -mm, you know, like that little music for you. Uh -uh, right? That, that makes me feel great, makes me feel grand, makes me feel powerful. And that's what narcissistic superiority feels like. It's the perfect slice of chocolate cake on the perfect day. And speaking of, of chocolate cake, I actually have a really great video that's on the chocolate cake model of narcissism, and that deals with relationships and how relationships with narcissists fit into eating chocolate cake. So I'll, I'll put a, a, a link right, right here for you. you can check that out. And the next one that we're going to talk about is sensitivity to criticism. And this is actually that central component that adds to the difficulty in working through narcissistic traits and narcissistic personality disorder. That is because that sensitivity to criticism that if you can't see what you need to change, then how do you change it? And because a lot of individuals along that narcissistic spectrum are very hypersensitive to criticism and they react negatively to varying degrees when they feel that that sense of superiority is threatened, when those maladaptive beliefs, behaviors, and patterns are shown to them to be ineffective, that they are actually destructive to their end goals. So they get very sensitive, they can get angry, sometimes you can have narcissistic rage, sometimes you can have narcissistic fits, which is more like a tantrum, things of that nature. So it really depends, because that tends to be more individualized as to how they'll respond to that criticism, but that sensitivity to criticism is absolutely there to keep that narcissistic superiority intact. Now lastly, manipulative communication. And I think that there is a degree of skill, and I don't mean in a positive way, but there is a degree of skill to narcissistic personality disorder. There is a degree of skill as to who, how they can enlist people into their life, pulling those individuals into their life. And they're able to identify those particular individuals that are willing to tolerate narcissistic behaviors. And manipulative communication is that we see that they use a lot of clever and very strategic communication tactics to manipulate others into agreeing with them or to gain admiration or valuation. And we, we see this because 
the way that they phrase things, very, very similar to what I talked at the beginning of the video, is it's you point out something that you know everybody knows. Oh, it's it's oh, can you believe it's raining outside? Of course it's raining outside. It's wet. Okay, that's part of manipulative communication because it makes you feel small and doubtful so that then that gives me perhaps a little space where I can then intervene, where I can then manipulate you to feel low enough to do the things I want to do so that my superiority remains intact and my narcissistic self remains safe. And that's the plan. And these seven traits, what I want you to do is I want you to think about, hmm, on the surface, you're not going to say, yeah, you know what, I'm really, I'm really attracted to somebody who exhibits exploitive behavior, they're really sensitive to any feedback I give them, whether it's criticism or not, and then I really want to be manipulated by the things that, that they say to me. Of, of course you're going to say no to that. So what we got to do is we got to be objective. How are these things illustrated in the people in your life? Think about your last two or three relationships. When you think about those relationships, are these traits exhibited? And if they are, what are those components that drew you to them. And you have to ask yourself, why was I attracted to this person? Now in hindsight, and immediately to sort of protect your psychological state, you may rationalize it away. Oh, well I had you know, this problem, that, that, and that may be too. There may be additional factors. But the goal of this is for you to look at that. And what was it at the time, and does it relate to now, that you allowed that person into your life, that they came into your life? Now, parents are, are a different deal, right? Because parents, you're kind of born into it. But as we get older, we are empowered with more choice as to how much we're going to interact with, with those individuals and how we can insulate and protect ourselves from that pain. And I, and I, have, I have videos on that as well. I want you to check out this video that I have on protecting yourself from... Uh, narcissistic pain and manipulation. That might really help you. But I think we got to look at what was it that got you in there to begin with. And that would be more of the relationship friendship stuff. And then the parent stuff, what, what, what kept you going back? What keeps you in that relationship? We have to explore these things. Because in order to understand narcissistic superiority and how destructive it can be to your life and your sense of self, we have to understand our components, our psychological self that got us into it to begin with. So I hope you found this helpful and please check out that video and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.